hi, we're here with again with uh, Martin and Sophie and uh, Lord Hugh. We're going to have a, another conversation like we did last Sunday. So how are you guys? Not too bad. You know, yeah. gales after gales here. It's been a month, a month and past the month of gales. The Atlantic is gone. Very bizarre. That's interesting because we've had a very mild winter here in Greece. So it's it's raining now and there, there are a few storms coming through, but all in all, it's a, a very settled winter. Um, people are remarking on it. So it changed. I, I'm sorry if you can't see me so well, um, but you know, it's kind of bright behind me. I can't do much about it. But oh yeah, yeah, you're a bit in the dark. Comes and goes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, uh, yes, yeah, as the sun goes down, it'll get better. But anyway, yeah. 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 And it, anyway, I was just looking at this Pakistan thing with, with the locusts, and it's it's getting completely <laughs> biblical. It's like this is the second horseman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know. And, 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 and you know, I've been I've been thinking about war because the um, uh, I th I've been thinking for a while. That's uh, on the cards and the implications now of it because um nobody's kind of looking but there was uh, a la the chinese fired a laser on a um, u.s reconnaissance plane which was kind of a hostile act apparently in the philippines and then this ho the the thing about them pulling out of afghanistan i didn't think was very good at all <laughs> i didn't take that as good news um, because you know, somebody said, where one of the one of the generals said, "We're pulling out of Afghanistan so we can concentrate on China." I was like, "Oh, mm -hmm. good to know." <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, the, you know, the third yes. horseman is is in the wings there. You know, I think it's, uh, yes. it's kind of yes. yeah. It's very very strange time, isn't it? It's, oh, it's unreal, and it's unreal, and it's funny. It's something that you know since a long time too. But you've pushed back, you know. For me, from my point of view, I'm I'm bringing back memories to me from 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I was I was thinking, but you know how we are young in life, children, work, and you don't put the pieces of the puzzle together very well when you're in the system and the machine. And suddenly, it looks everything kind of starts to get together. Saying, "Oh, yeah, <laughs> I knew this, and now this, and now this, yeah." But it's, mm -hmm. it, it's funny to see it happening. You know, we've known it's going to happen for so long. And when it finally arrives, it's, I, I must say that I get a bit of schadenfreude occasionally and I, I start to I get this morbid sense of relief that, that you know, because it's been so long in the making. You think yeah. now that it actually is all these things they've been waiting for, and we've been waiting for, but now they're coming true. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's not nice at all, but it's, it's a relief that the, you know, the, the, the anticipation is, is over. But and now yes. we're really living real stuff. Do you, do you get that yes. at all? Yes, and it gives yeah. us a sense of sanity. But we are not yeah, that's it. to have no, the, That's it. I mean, you know, if you say all this stuff is coming, then you're a crazy ass bitch. And that's the way it's yeah. been for, for decades. And now it's like, Oh no! Who's the crazy ass bitch? Yeah, that's that's like, I was yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's kind crazy. of a relief for, for I know. humans to say, "There, I told you." <laughs> and it's like we are very privileged to be in this time, us to alive humans to be seeing all this. I mean, it it might be horrible, and the doomer doomer sphere might be a bit of a depressing place, but at the same time, there's a privilege there. Like it's it's enormous. Oh, I think so. It's it's like you know you got a time machine, where, where you you don't go back to the boring bits of history. You don't go back to Switzerland <laughs> and invent the cuckoo clock. You could go back to the fall of Rome, or, or otherwise yes. Xerxes' disaster in Greece, or something. Oh, yeah. you know, right? <laughs> that was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so there's it's funny how there's you know relief in all this. It's it has so many aspects and i think one of the things is that just the dread of it all is kind of unidimensional and when yeah. it actually mm -hmm. comes then you see it's so funny to see people's reactions and how it all it's funny here for me in greece because you know that you have all these yachts uh, there are not many around at the moment but they <laughs> um one or two this german guy next to me he just 
came from Munich, and people are kind of drifting back to their boats, but there's there's an American English couple that are just on the on the town quay and they're having a really rough time because of these storms coming through have been beating them against the quay and they don't really have enough money to um to come into the marina and take shelter though it's just next door so they they trying to like scrape by on getting mussels and stuff for food <laughs> and eat, eating mussels on the road so and she it, she's actually a kind of um minor celeb sort of a, a you, I won't mention her name, but she's in, in a lot of these movies. Um, I was going to mention one of the movies everybody's mentioning now. It's called Contagion. <laughs> so there's plenty of of humor in the, in that because of the Contagion movie, um, which you have oh, yeah. to do with. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I mean, like, but the funny thing is, you, you know, it's just typical that you can't predict any of this stuff because here this is a big part of um i won't tell her tell you the association she has with that movie but because that will kind of dox her but the but she's not she has she's been having so much trouble with her boat and everything like that that she's um she hasn't been keeping up with the news that i saw today <laughs> she didn't know anything about the coronavirus <laughs> and so she said oh is it getting bad and i said uh yeah somewhat <laughs> and so so then uh and then these these other australian guys that are just um just uh on the same pontoon as me they, they're a little old, bit older so they you know they've been through pirate infested they just come through pirate infested excuse boys. me i have to go and let the cat out who's, who's oh yeah, yeah back sure. in a second <laughs> yeah yeah we, i think the cash wants full attention <laughs> <laughs> As soon as, you, as soon as you're tied up and you hurry he goes to the <laughs> I, I saw, I saw uh, somebody on somebody on Reddit was on on the collapse sub was saying like, "Hey, I've got a pet. Is that going to be a liability or an asset <laughs> to the collapse?" I said, well, well, that's a liability up like... until the very end, and then it could be a rather delicious asset. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, but I think the majority of, of the people on the collapse on the Reddit on the collapse Reddit are at school kids or young students I yeah. think by the, the profile yeah. of remarks and stuff like it looks pretty like they're in a video game kind of thing you know yeah yeah it's it's that all over reddit that's what it seems to be <laughs> but, but yeah anyway so i say these um these australian guys are a little older and they so they're getting a little worried about it so they've They've uh, provisioned their boats. It's a big boat, but it's like healing to one side. They've got so much provisions on board, and um, and so yeah. we're, we're, we're going to go out to dinner. And there was like, no, they said, no, we're quarantining from here on out. And so they self quarantining. Is so like, oh, okay, but uh, everybody's so casual in Greece. They, it's like when the medicain came through in Crete. Nobody did anything. There were there was, uh, I think one guy I saw went and strapped down his uh, chairs and tables at the restaurant outside. <laughs> if it was America, they'd be battening up the you know, know. Up the know. windows and they'd be getting, the toilet paper would be clean out. <laughs> In Greece, it's just like coffee coffee time conversation. That's that <laughs> thing with the toilet paper is just like. <laughs> yeah, isn't that the funniest thing about the it's toilet? The funny thing it's, that people it's like, think about. It's, it's, it's like <laughs> the majority of the world, like ninety percent of the world, uses water. <laughs> they don't use toilet paper, but in America, <laughs> in America toilet paper is a necessity. <laughs> you've got to, you've got to, and in Australia, you've got to fight people to get off the shop. It's like, it's well, a, I, I have so to funny. laugh when I when I hear that on the news because it's just what, and it, and they're starting in France. It's not, I've looked at the French media and it's starting to look like that. There's this madness about masks and gels, you know, and they're just, just... anyway, mask and mobilization, for... nothing it... towards climate. <laughs> Not really. It's gonna it's gonna last for for months. You can't prep your way. I mean, this is what I've been saying all along is is you can't prep your way out of it. And now you now you see why. I've been trying to tell people for for a year that you know it you can't escape collapse in a bunker because it's economic for one thing 
you know, your, your house will be repossessed and your bunker along with it long before you ever get to the stage where you, you know, living off dried food or freeze dried food. So, you know, it's, um, and, and you can see it now. It's, you know, people that are, are in the gig economy, they can't afford to get sick. They can't afford to, you know, if they if the business closes, if you, you're, you're lucky if you're a white collar worker or a school teacher, you can, you know, yeah. go online. Mm -hmm. But if you actually have to, if you're in the service economy and you have to turn up to work and they just say, okay, we don't need any cleaning. The office is closed. Everybody's working from home. You're in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, so there, there's going to be all those kind of impacts which people don't, uh, aren't anticipating. Yeah, it's very, do you, do you think people have a very cartoonish idea of this? Because I think everybody has a very cartoonish idea of contagion and stuff, and you're going to find out that it's nothing like that. And that's kind of been my message for a while. Well, here the the big the big issue here seems to be there will be less tourists. And Greece, yeah. here no, here not. <laughs> We're in Greece too. <laughs> and everywhere. <laughs> Economically, we are a bit a bit yeah. better off than you, but we had the same bailout and the same problem in 2008, and we rely on tourism. Well, no, we don't, but. A lot of people rely on tourism for their lifestyle and everything. So, you know, it, it is, yeah. That's, that's, the right that's thing. American tourists, right? American tourists. No. Here we get Italian, French, German, uh, few American, much less American than before, but still quite a lot in the, in the cities and the, you know, the, yeah, they, the roots they, industry they, and the, you know. They do the castle tours, basically. Yeah, the Americans do the castle <laughs> tours. The, yeah. the English come now a lot. And a lot of English have bought property here uh, yeah. and have taken yeah. citizenship. There's 900 British citizens who were made Irish citizens last week because of Brexit and probably uh, regulating their businesses and tax affairs here. Because we've got a very low corporate tax here, 12%. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of big companies, American mostly, and pharmaceutical a lot, and IT here. So, yeah. Yeah, Apple's the though. Apple's mm -hmm. though. Apple's there in Dublin, I think. Yeah, Apple, Facebook, mm. Google. Mm -mm. Yeah. yeah, almost tax free. Yeah, almost. Mm. Yeah, Amazon. Amazon paid tax for the first time, I think, ever. <laughs> and it was it was some paltry percentage. It was almost two percent. <laughs> yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, but yeah, so all those rich guys, they they can't head out to New Zealand or anything. They. I know. They can, what are they going to do? They've spent so much money on those bunkers in New Zealand and everywhere. What the poor thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 a theme park there or something? But I, actually, that's kind of an interesting thing because because a, a boat is actually my prepping strategy. Um, and yeah. And it's panning. Uh, if I don't get Corona, because <laughs> <well>, yay! <laughs> but uh, I'm. I'm actually heading out to the islands on Tuesday because the Good. not because ba basically that was uh, what I was paid up for the marina. I was intending to start sailing mm -hmm. then anyway. So, so I'm finishing wintering now just at the right time, I think, to get to get out. But well, the interesting yeah. thing is about these these big boats. There's there's one super yacht that just came in. And I, I don't know who, who's on board, but they now they closed the marina. They won't let any of the tourists come and walk around. Ah. Anything. So I thought it had something to do with whoever's <laughs> on the super yacht. Something to do with your book. <laughs> ah, no, they, they wouldn't be. They wouldn't be so close to me if they knew the book that I just wrote. <laughs> 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 they, they would be like, a little further out <laughs> if they knew. That. <laughs> Actually, that, yeah, it makes me think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah. Maybe I'm, I'm parting gifts for a while. <laughs> and how is the situation with those poor people at the border? Um, in Lesbos. We see pictures of horrible pictures. Too. Uh, in Lesbos? I know when the Greek people, what, are, what the people you meet, what, what's going on there? Like it, oh, it, no, it, they take it in their stride. They, it takes a lot to, to fluster them. What, what's been going on a lot is um, in Turkey, the, you know, basically Erdogan is trying to put pressure on the, um, uh, the EU. Hmm. And the way he does it is by releasing immigrants. Um, From the concentration camps where they were? 
or is these, it why, these guys I don't think even came into the concentration camp because they're having this right. attack on I Ibid. Um, mm -hmm. Then uh, I think the Turks were expelled from it, and then a lot of uh, refugees came from that. So that he's trying to force those refugees into the EU to get them to support um, support him in Syria. Mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. I think there's a stalemate now in Ibid, but he's he's still. What they're doing apparently is they're taking the guys to the border and then just pushing them across, saying, giving them free trips, you know, basically. Yes. So, um, yes. Yeah. But how are so, the Greek reacting? I think they're going th through the EU, but there's there's always a possibility of war. That you know, they the the boats and the planes are um, getting into rumbles with each other. Um, so a lot of lot of aerial activity now. They've these F-15s and stuff that flying overhead all the time, but mm. the yeah the this neither side wants to go to war, but there's, there's potential for for mm. conflict. I mean, there was always always just the, with the Hellenic Coast Guard and the the um, the Turkish Navy, <coughs> mm -hmm. but I think mm -hmm. that's that's heating up. And then mm -hmm. in Athens, I think it's heating up too. The you know anarchist marches and things like that. There was um, yeah, so it's it's all fun and games. It's uh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. But I I think that there's the tourists are not going to be coming this year. Mm. Um, I think I think that goes for most places, a lot of places yeah. here as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that they live off that money, so that it's mm -hmm. going to you know they're going to have to restructure their society. There's this thing where people rent, you know, basically they, uh, this is something which I think even in Britain, they're going to have to look at because you can't go into a crisis with half the population renting off the other half, you know, basically parasitic mm. on their backs. And mm. so, you know, if you, if you have commercial property here and the, the guy, the tourists don't come, you just have to make an arrangement with your tenant and say, okay, they don't pay rent, you know, that kind of thing. And I think we're yes. going to have to do the same. You can't have, most people I think here on, in yachts, they, you, they, the older people that have property in Britain and then, you know, they're living rent. off that rental income by some poor young people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Yeah, we met some in Turkey, you know, like that, the English who have mm. property, they rent it and they live in the sun. There's so many people who started doing that a bit older than us, or maybe a generation, I don't know. I, mean, I don't I don't know, I don't function that way, I don't yeah. think that way, but it looks like, yeah, there's, there's an enormous amount. They're doing it in Spain, in I France, mean, in Portugal. Yeah. England in particular, mm. France to some degree as well. Mm. Mm. Well, they will... You see, it, it's another consumer trap. They're told, you know, you work, you, you get your pension, you rent your, you buy property, you pay off your property, and then you go in the sun and you rent your place and you're into the, the cycle of, of exploiting other people and you just, you know, you keep the thing going. That, that's how I see it for the last maybe 10, 15 years since the, what we have called the Celtic Tiger here. We saw, we, saw, we saw people who were just off the bog suddenly going to buy property in Spain or Bulgaria, do you remember how we laughed? Or Florida. Or Florida, <laughs> which, like in 2003 or four. Oh, that guy, he was just taking off his wellies full of mud and turf, and now he's got three apartments in Spain, do you know, and you're like, no! <laughs> <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's not right because it's the, the, we're all living off the younger generation, they're not going to put up with that. Yeah. No. So much longer. Only for a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so there's a question is is about the um, you know I've been trying to get a debt strike going with XR and stuff. Of course, no, no luck, but including a rent strike for for that reason as well that that you know younger people need relief. But what do you think now because of this uh, because of the virus? They're probably going to start cancelling things, and I, I expect Exxon is going to scale back. And the game, the game I think that they, this is the golden opportunity. This is the time when you should be actually going all out. And I, I think that probably, it, it yeah. would be better for them. I mean, you know, they've got to get off off of the street, stop having mass action and having 
these uh, people. They have to anyway. They Gather have to anyway because gatherings are going to be banned. Yeah, but it's a good thing because it'll force them to thing. stop mm. these dysfunctional tactics that, that aren't doing any good. Um, and and they'll force them to innovate a bit more and do something online. But what I su suspect they're going to do is just just uh, tone it down, just not do anything, which I think is a huge mistake. It's uh, if they yeah. were real revolutionaries, <laughs> this oh. is this is God's it's an gift. Opportunity. Now yeah. Time. Definitely. Yes. 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 What do you think about about uh, about the the, the, the XR news, Martin? Because we, we didn't talk the other day with. With you, Yvonne, and well, I think now is the time that the because people are going to be genuinely affected now, anyway. So, you know, it's, it's the time to act. I mean, the government they're talking here about sick pay and about people that will have to stay at home and stuff, but it's all that's fine for a week or two, but that's not going to last. People aren't going to be paid to, to not come to work for too long. So I think I could see rents and you know that that will have a follow on and a knock on effect. I can see absolute mayhem, mayhem and I must yeah. say it brings a smile on my face because I I, I just I, I know there's going to be victims. I know it's going to be difficult. I know you're going to have to have a lot of show a lot of solidarity and be there for your neighbours and but it's going to be total mayhem. I mean, and I I nearly hope that because you know. People are not questioning anything. They're just, I, I'm, I've listened to the people who are faced in Italy or France, and their, their big problem is, oh, we can't put the kids to school. Uh, we can't go on holidays. We can't, you know, it, the business as usual is questioned there. And that's where XR could have done something questioning the business as usual. And now the virus is, is leading people to question that business as usual. And that's where we have to reflect and think, where, where does the climate, where does the, the where does tearing down the system come into that? How do we, you know, how well, do we link with the coming situation? Do you think that the, this will uncork the bottle? Uh, yeah. You know, if you break the seal, stop all the nonsense, you know, and uh, sort of fake protest and begin genuine protest. Strong possibility, I think. But I think uh, XR should be stoking the, the embers, trying to trying to do that. That's mm -hmm. traditionally what revolutionary movements have always done. They they basically not try and make it easier on the people, but make it harder no. so that yeah. then they rebel against. Because comfortable slaves won't, uh, you know, it's not worth the venture for them. It's only when they're not getting their bowl of rice a day that they really think about burning down the plantation. But it's a question of timing because before you see there's going to be fascist reactions and tightening of liberties and everything around the world at the moment with this crisis so if rebellion and, and movements of action don't step in now it's going to be more and more difficult i think yes it's a closing window but this is what mm -hmm. i'm 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 thinking that there is something new and I think that anarchists are missing it. I think revolutionaries all over the world are missing it. I think anarchists have kind of checked out. Um, most of our generation, uh, radicals in our generation, think that, you know, revolution is never going to happen. And then just forget it. And I think they're making a big mistake because there's something definitely new. Uh, and I'll, I'll, you know, stake, put my hat in the ring on this one. And that's that this idea that it's going to be a fascist or uh, say a communist uh, reaction against some kind of collapse, I think is completely wrong. I think that's the old story. And I think what's, what's new is that it's going to be a totalitarian state reaction. So you mm -hmm. won't be able to see the difference. Just, just like we've seen a drift to say the communist party in China, the CCP has drifted towards state capitalism mm -hmm. and they very they barely distinguishable from any you know wartime capitalist economy yeah. in china yeah. and i think that everybody will converge there even western democracies so that when they start clamping down being totalitarian it'll look the same it'll just be the vanilla state and it you won't really be able to call them communists or um 
call it capitalist because they'll just be a wartime type managed economy and mm -hmm. this kind of totalitarian oppression and not much freedom of speech, a lot of censorship. And it'll look the same in whatever country you're in. And so I think what's new coming, and this is the opportunity that I think uh, the old star revolutionaries, particularly the older ones like us, uh, should should be saying, no, there's something new coming. And that's that horizontally across the board, that it now it's just the, the state. It's not a communist state. It's not a fascist state. It's not one of those old reactions. There's not the, the 1930s where... You remember that thing where they had in um, in Cabaret with Liza Mullally and that yes. movie? And there was a bit in the movie where the rich capitalist bastard um, that was playing both of them, uh, and yes. uh, he said, yeah, well, we'll just let the communists and the fascists fight it out. They'll exhaust each other and then we'll take over. Yes. And they're saying, like, I no, that. I don't think so. I think the fascists are going to win. And they were right. And but, and that's how people are thinking now. And I don't think it's, it's, no, it's, it's not quite like that. I think if you look, um, it, there's something getting close to the horseshoe theory that on the extremes of the right and the left, they are very, very similar. If you look at an eco-fascist and you check off all the things they believe, you get a long way down the list on say, and you know, the, the communists or the socialists and you know, any kind of rebellious extreme, they check off a lot of the boxes. It, it finally gets to a box about, you know, oh, well, something about, yeah, they, they kind of um, ethnocentric and they think that eco-destruction is caused by migration. Then there's, a, there's a, a division there. But if you, if you, there's so many points they check off that capitalism is evil, globalism is evil, you know, this kind of economy can't go on. They're, they're, it's taking a toll in terms of suicides. It's taking a toll in terms of the, you know, um, the the rich getting richer and this inequality and and so they're checking the same boxes all the way down but still saying oh you're a fascist and you're, you're coming to say like at some point i think they're going to stop saying that and they're going to say look it's just the state it's just the raw totalitarian exactly state. State. It, it, it doesn't so they're becoming anarchists and i think yes. people are missing yes. Is, is people are drifting towards anarchism. The concept of state is starting to, to, to dawn on people for me, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, once, once you're in quarantine in, a, in an apartment complex in Milan or in Wuhan, and the, the state is, you know, not feeding you and keeping you under oppression and basically keeping, you know, the, the, the channels of economics going or keeping the economic system turning over just for the sake of profit and, you know, forget human life and health and safety. You, you can see that in Italy just as much as in China, or I believe that's where we're headed soon. And then people will say, you know, this is, we're all, we're all anarchists finally. We can all see that this is not the way we want to do it. This is not the way we would handle it. We, you know, I, I didn't ask for this global economy. I didn't ask for a gig uh, economy where I can just in the precariat trying to survive. And, yeah, but and so I don't need it. But the addiction to, to, to the fossil fuel life, you know, the addiction to the, the, the comforts and the, the mobile phones and the et cetera, et cetera, of, of the fossil fuel life, that is, uh, we've got two or three generations. I mean, we, we didn't grow up with that sort of stuff, but my children and grandchildren, the, well, there's a whole lot of people in their 30s who are going to be in that situation, let down by the state, questioning the state. But what is going to be, what is, I, I don't know, what is going to happen to that addiction? It, it's going to be superseded by hunger. Yeah. 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 You see, you see the resourceful. People are going to find out they're going to have to fall back on local economies. And the local economy is devastated, and people are going to find it out. Well, what will happen is what's what's normal if if you remove the state what's normal in these situations is people start doing uh, basically victory gardens and start to uh doing self-help networking yeah and i think that's what people are going to do if you if you um if you haven't got any work to do you you're gonna run out of, you're gonna get bored with netflix pretty pretty soon <laughs> and you're gonna start doing these kind of things so um, yeah. if you're going to find out that you know 
hey, you, you can't get bananas all the time anymore. You, you know, you can't get kiwi fruit just whenever you I want it. <laughs> it's just, um, you're going to have to go foraging. You're going to have to, you know, share your skills. All that is a dream come true for me, to be honest. Yeah, that's what, that's what <laughs> I'm saying. Is, that's what I've been wishing for since I was 20, 30. You know, I just, but even but, before. But, but it's, it's caught anarchists asleep at the wheel because they all, yeah. they all offer in identity politics and stuff. And they say like, no, <laughs> it's like, hey, while you, while you are out to lunch, this our moment has come. You know? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know. I know. Well, yeah. it is definitely it could be a community thing if it's going to if things are going to work properly. It will have to be people will have to get together and try between barter and like people were doing in Ireland. Before, yeah, like, like when I arrived here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, it's just like that. You, you you get along, you manage. You even have to get along with people you don't really like, but you have to because things have to work <laughs> that way. And you know, you just you know to get your eggs and to get your fish and to get different things. Mm. You need to get a lift to go to to, to the mainland by from an island, or you need to get a lift in a car. You hitchhike because there's only one car in the village. I mean, that's how it was. But isn't the island well positioned there? Because I, I feel like Greece is well positioned there. They have really strong social cohesion. Yeah. Um, I think Ireland is not too bad positioned because it's a small country, it's an island, and the networks are still here. Even though they've been pretty battered by immigration and by the, the neoliberal um, lifestyle. But uh, yeah, it's not too far well, in the past. What do you think? It's well within living memory. <laughs> when when it had to be done, hmm. so yeah, I think it could be brought back soon enough. With your family, <laughs> your friends, your network, Martin, in, in the community, uh, are, are they ready to, to be resilient? Well, they won't have a choice. Yeah, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just true. <laughs> you know, it's just how hard it is when it happens. But isn't it important to have uh, hard times within living memory? So I think one of the reasons why they're so resilient in 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 Greece is because they've got a long memory of history and it's like this is not so bad you know basically no. there's a there's a it's monument gorgeous. over here just just outside the city hall and it was it's basically the two plaques this is when the Turks came and this is when the Turks left Turks left 1913 the Turks left Turks arrived they were like on the marble statues, they're all chopping Greeks' heads off. It's like the most gruesome thing you've ever seen. And then, then when they leave, they're all like signing a paper and holding an olive branch and stuff. And mm. But that's 1913, so basically the people out here are like, yeah, 40,000 people died in Athens during the war um, of starvation while their food was taken. Yes, that's Africa, right. Or, you know, so. I think Portugal, Greece, Ireland, and a few Eastern Eastern European countries who have who have in living memory, you know, some really hard and recent hardships, they'll do quite well. I think they will. They will, and their ecosystems are. I'm not saying that they're intact. None is. None is nowhere. Or some. They're not as bad as in the UK or well, France or Germany. You know, there's no Holland and the population is small Europe. enough. Yeah. Yeah, but there's, there's a. There's a possibility, like let's say it comes really, you know, that the shit hits the fan in a big way, no more fuel. Well, you can still it, climate promising and no methane dragon arriving, like in a in a Macpherson scenario. Um, but we can still go out and pick wide routes. We've got fish, we've got rivers, lakes, with things, we've got nuts in the trees. You know what I mean? Like you hunger won't <laughs> hunger won't be a problem. I don't yeah. know how it is in Greece because you have the water sink situation. The problem is that what the Greece relied on fishing. Yeah. And so, but you know, I wonder if if the state won't protect the waters now. If um, if everything breaks down and there really is rationing, I can't imagine them allowing you know, these Russian trawlers and Spanish trawlers in mm -hmm. these waters anymore. Just, just, they're just sweeping mm -hmm. them out like a vacuum cleaner. And 
Yeah. I mean, I don't see the Greeks putting up with it. I mean, if the, the, the guys will go and, uh, you know, put Molotov cocktails on the deck of a trawler if it comes in too close, in, you know, in hard times. But another thing I'm thinking of with the marit in the maritime line is, you know, you know how it's difficult for, for refugees to get north in Europe to get to where they want to get, which is UK. I don't know why, but they don't want to go to the UK. It's just this kind of, but come north as they are going from North Africa to to Greece or to Sicily or wherever, and they're going through Turkey. To, is there is there any way that they can get here clandestine? I mean, is there any networks to get these people out here? Because I don't know. I'm dreaming. I'm just dreaming. But I've always hoped that in my my little home that I have, I could hide again some people, but you know, in a in a yeah, in a clandestine way, and get them over and get get networks because we're thinking of. We're thinking of a wonderful country we have, and it's great. We'd be okay because we have a bit of peace. But these people, how to get them here to share that with us? That's easy. I don't think it's possible now because they, they're coming, um, for one thing, they're very diverse, right? So they've come yeah. deeper and deeper in, in Africa. Now, if they yeah, they're they're in like Chad and stuff, so it's not like North Africans. Um, I know, yeah. Yeah, and I the I mean it's what's the world to come I think is going to be increasingly bigger world so the world has been shrinking and shrinking I think the big thing in 2020 is the world is going to start getting bigger again which I'm very pleased about very I didn't like about. it you know global village I think global oh, village fantastic. I hated that, that, that global village notion I, I just yeah. didn't make any sense well, it's not a global village. It's a, it's a global city, and it, and so I think it's been it, it'll reverse now. It's not going to be shrinking anymore. It's going to be getting bigger. So the distance for a refugee from from North Africa to Ireland is is a phenomenal distance. Um, if if uh, if you're thinking in terms of border restrictions, um, mm -hmm. oh yeah, like yeah. So. So you so, reckon the traveling is going to be curtailed enormously, that the, the transit of people who are trying to escape sub-Saharan Africa are going to, it's going to, it's going to reduce? Yeah, the problem for, for refugees is, is, is it costs money. It costs money to travel, to move. And people don't normally think of that. They think that you just, you know, yeah. hop, hop on a raft and, you know, get, and say, you know, I had a, a, a Vietnamese girlfriend who was a boat person. In, in in America, you know, they're kind of you know, closet racist, sometimes closet, sometimes overt, but anyway, racist. And so they're a little bit racist towards the Vietnamese. And, and the fact that she was a boat person, um, you know, a lot of people were a bit sniffy about that, you know, thinking, you're a boat person. But, and especially it's Vietnam War and not good memories and stuff. But what they didn't know, what white people in America didn't know was that to be a boat person, you had to be super rich. Basically, it's it's a mark of status, because she was put on a boat, and she she paid the going rate. So the going rate was her weight in gold. So you had to have gold oh. bullion, as much as her weight for her father had that amount of money, and that's how she got to be a boat person. Now we don't think of that as a you. If you think of somebody from uh, South Sudan or something, you're talking about. Uh, people that have maybe a, a wage of a, a grand or something a year, an income of something like a thousand dollars a year, they yeah. can pay a few thousand dollars just to make a, a trip from like Turkey to Lesbos, which is, is you, you know, you can almost spit that distance because mm -hmm. because the reason is that it's controlled. The barriers are controlled. These are not open barriers. The the state, in a way, is assisting all these. Um, mafiosos in effect and mm -hmm. so it becomes a lucrative uh, chain so they're, they're really goods on a kind of a silk road and they have to pay their way in as contraband in effect so you have to you have contraband prices going along these trade routes and exploitation at every route so so you, even if you make it across one route the chances are that you know 
you get all your money stripped off you. You can you can't hide all that mm. much money by sewing it into a jacket or something. So the guys taking you across, they'll they'll rob you and steal you of your your money in one of those hops. So so it's each one of those hops is a big risk. And to get to Ireland, in uh, when there's a real lockdown and stuff, there might be three or four hops. Each one of them is almost a superhuman effort. Yeah, we had we had um, for the last <clears throat> in 2000 at the beginning flux of asylum seekers who arrived to Ireland, Ireland because suddenly there were some EU regulations that every country had to take a quota, and we had direct uh, me and Martin and I direct um, connection with a lot of people from different countries on Africa, North Africa, um, Arabic countries, um, and the story that you're telling is exactly what they told us: the money and the, the, the networks. A big, a very important network for refugees was those Christian, born again kind of evangelical networks. They were, they were doing a lot in that. They must be making a pile of money in that too because they were arranging an awful lot of things, weren't they? We heard a lot of those stories. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah well, yeah. well I, the, the, the thing is though, as it's as things get worse then the, the lockdown gets more and more stark so if you look in the depression you get a lot of these um hobos and guys on the on the rail um on the rail networks yeah uh, jumping trains and yeah. uh, but eventually as the depression set in more and more they would get bulls in the in the rail yards that would stop people getting off and beat them up and say, you know, yeah. although it's, it's illegal to make barriers between states, it's anti-constitutional, but they did. If you, you couldn't get into, if you're an Oki, you couldn't get into California. The police would stop you on the bridges yeah. and the roads and beat the crap out it. of you, you know, to keep yeah. you out. And so that, that kind of stuff starts, the, the state starts to get muscly. So you can't, it, you can't really hitchhike to Ireland, hmm. um, say from Lesbos, right? Unless you, the yeah, chances, I know. The chances yeah. of you getting off Lesbos is close to zero. Yeah, it's extremely. It's, the surveillance is enormous, especially now. I think it's going to be tightened completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it, it is already. It, yeah. So we've been seeing a lot of this from uh, from the yachting community. Um, it's been living with us for a long time because while you're out. They have a lot of patrols, uh, especially Italy, uh, Spain, Portugal, um, Greece as well. But they don't have the manpower. But while while you're out, you have you have these um, reconnaissance planes coming over and they circle you, kind of real dramatic stuff. Um, and they they call you on the radio and they ask yeah. you to participate in this. I can't remember what it's called. It's called Operation Something Shield. Everything's called Something Shield. <laughs> it is. It's Fortress Europe. <laughs> it is. It's, it's called a Fortress Shield or some shit. Yes, <laughs> like I that. know. Yeah. And then, or you know, it might as well be called Operation Drawbridge. And then yes. the uh, and they ask you, will you participate? And they get you to sign up to like you know, uh, shop any any refugees coming in. But one of the topics of conversation, um, well, there are two topics of conversation amongst yachties, and one of them is the chances of your boat getting hijacked are going out all the time. Um, okay. And the other topic is what the hell do you do if you see like 10 guys in this boat that's sinking out there? And so yes. that's, that's a, you know, mm -hmm. over beers, that's a topic of conversation because you, you tell you your life's at risk if you go and try and pick them up. You don't know what they're going to do. They might nobble you and take the boat. It could be a setup. The, the rumors that there there are setups like that that they, the the guys go out try to get uh, get rescued so they can capture a boat. Well, why why wouldn't they? You know. Yeah, it's piracy. So it's basically you're on the edge of you don't know if it's a, a fake pirate situation. So it's it, it's 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 was always interesting sailing around this part, but it's the, the Mediterranean has always been a very interesting place. <laughs> well, well, I, I, I want to get together a pirate fleet and start. <laughs> <Thank talking>. you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you reading the Ulysses again? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think uh, basically it's uh, a great idea to just. To, if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I just think of all the. The, the targets that'll be around soon from fishing boats to oil tankers that'll be like the 
<laughs> target rich area around here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, it's it's difficult to know in a case like that if you do come across a a raft or a boat that's half sunk. What to do? As you say, it could be set up. On the other hand, you don't want to sail by and let people drown. Yeah, I, I think the consent. I think I did hear actually that they recommend that you don't um, get too close, um, po po possibly because they're trying to drive them back. But the, um, I think the general concern. What I would do in that situation is is you know call the Hellenic Coast Guard and Maybe. just kind of stand off mm -hmm. and just just see mm -hmm. how the situation develops. Yes, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean that you know. Who knows if you can actually reach them and whether they would come. <laughs> you, might, you might have to spend days watching these people drown or something. It's like, no, it's, it's, uh, no nobody, that's why it's a topic of conversation. Nobody looks looks forward to it. Yeah. But, it, but you talk about topic of conversation. I'm, I'm suddenly reflecting the conversation we're having here with you now at the moment, online, you in Greece, you know, we can't have a conversation like this with most people in down the road. Hmm? No. <laughs> in the pub. With most people. No. Um, I was in town this week and um, there was a few remarks about the crisis with the epidemic and the virus and the plague and shut off. Like we said, the last conversation, you know, let's talk about something. You can't have a long open heart conversation around here about these subjects at all, at all, at all. How long do you think it will last? Because at some stage, people will will have those conversations for comfort. You know, it's it's comforting. I think it'll last until it's you know people who say understood until they're not until they're not up, and uh, it's yeah. not going to be soon. But I I couldn't see it changing while there's a choice. I tried to engage a, a guy involved in tourism the other day, and all he was talking about is how it was going to trust the possibility for him going to golf tournaments. Mm. You know, yeah. And I was okay. Let's have another drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what the thing that I think activists should be doing, and guys like XR, um, should be trying to get people, move people along psychologically. And one of the ways to do it, I think, is to get people off their cell phones, off the kind of. Um, uh, of their electronic devices. I, I just just before this this call, I was having a look at this thing where the suicide rate is spiking in America. And one of the things they they cite is um, you know online media and the screen you know world of screens um, is is making people depressed and they they uh, and so I I think if we all get quarantined watching Netflix and stuff. <laughs> um, it would be a, a good idea to try and disrupt the internet and try and, you know, yes. people, because yes. you don't want people sitting watching Hollywood for two months. You want people getting out and trying to get a shared human experience, you know. Yeah, it's kind of, everybody... Where everybody's set to go is to go and hunker down and hide their head in, you know, silicon. The Chinese, the Chinese people in Wuhan, my, my nephew is married to a Chinese lady. She's a lovely girl. They live in France now. They've left, they've left China uh, this year. The last time they were there was in January, actually, and they came back very quick. But she's sending me what the people are doing. <laughs> they locked up in their houses, and it's, it's media and funny videos and they must be spending the whole day between the computers and the mobile phones. It's just like, it's what, 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 what would happen? Home. But what would happen if it all went down, if it all went dark? Yeah, but you see, I think those are the yeah. things that are going to be left as, as, as tools of control, and they are powerful. Uh, the, the mobile networks are used by security, army, health, etc. The internet, it's the same for strategic reasons and stuff. So those are the things that are going to probably function for a long time. That'd be the last to fall. You see, and and the control. Yeah. So to get to get your average person to to, to not fall into that trap of being, uh, you know, glued to the screens is going to be very difficult. 
Well, I, I mean, I said that in my book that that the the those systems will stay up surprisingly long because yeah. they they were developed by the military. The the internet was developed by DARPA, and it's uh, it was designed. The reason it's designed like it is that even the IP addressing system was designed for redundancy. And so basically, there's the I don't know how redundant. I don't think anybody really knows how redundant it is anymore. But in when it was originally conceived, it was supposed to have a lot of redundancy, redundant pathways. Um, I don't think it's all that redundant anymore because you have all these choke points. One of the things that governments have done with things like surveillance and echelon is they've funneled all the internet traffic into places like Gibraltar and into. Um, uh, in, I can't remember what the place, the Echelon place is in uh, in England, but they funnel the transatlantic. There's a there's a hub just near High Ireland, and they funnel all the internet traffic through there so that they can can monitor it. Um, and so they've undermined its redundancy and its resilience. But but I think because all of these systems are military, as you say, underneath, it's it's kind of like the road networks in the 1950s. People think they were built for, you know, basically everybody in the 1950s yeah. to get in their Studebakers and, <laughs> and go traveling on Route 66. And it was like, no, that you know, one of the primary things was for military. They were they wanted to, um, they wanted to be able to shift armies around America internally, and that's the one of the reasons for the, the highway system. People don't know that. Right? That was one of the goals of Eisenhower. What, what, uh, what, what do you identify as bo as bottleneck? Uh, in in this uh, internet structure, internet network, you because you uh, particularly <laughs> particularly where where cables come on shore, so they have a lot of fiber bundles, and um, you know they 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 concentrated. Um, uh, there's one across the Atlantic. Then uh, there's one in Africa that was hauled up by a ship. Africa was cut off um, a few years mm -hmm. back. Because a ship just dragged anchor, so you can see on a marine chart where all these these cables yeah. are, and it's uh, it's yeah. If if there was concerted effort to cut the those off, but you see, uh, it might even assist the state if you cut those off because uh, you know basically I think people like China that have have deliberately fired off the the Great Wall of the Great Firewall of China. Is deliberately trying trying to section off their bit of the internet, and I think a part of the state's dream is to have a highly controlled local internet that's cut off from the rest of the world, so you can't probably. It's kind of like the television network, like Chichesco, you know, television regime. Mm. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't know it would be a, beneficial for the people if you cut those those trunks. What would be beneficial for the people is if you got you know, people off their their cell phones. Um, so, so it's it's kind of like it, it's not a question of making sure that they can't communicate. Communication is valuable. The thing is, is the thing is where they're using it as a as a drug and escape. So yeah. that it's it's the escape inside these electronic devices. But, uh, yeah, but as you said, that's 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 that sort of dissociation. Would be extremely good by by hunger and and risk to catch a, a a virus or something like that. I suppose when you have to to look after your basic needs, you will not look for dissociation on the. You know, I don't know. Yeah, but um, I you know, I, I think I of the way it's going to come down is you, these people are so infantilized that. It's where we are is really like the inmates in in Auschwitz, and one of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the one of the terrible yeah. things that I read. I mean, it was really shocking for me and gave me lots of food for thought. Uh, and that was when I read about the like uh, places like Auschwitz and that. And so, when those places were liberated, the the SS and the Capos and all the guys that knew that they had it coming for them, they left. And then it was about three days, three or four days before the Allies arrived. Mm -hmm. In that period, you know, basically all these guys are sitting there thinking how, you know, wonderful it would be to get out of this situation and about surviving it. And there the gates were left open and they stayed in those camps for three yeah. days, three or four days. 
Now, they didn't have any food. They, they, they raided the kitchens and stuff, and then, you know, the canteens were, but they emptied the food out in no time. So when you see those emaciated guys in those pictures, you've got to subtract four days of basically that they did it to themselves. They could have left those camps, and they didn't. And the reason they didn't was because they were institutionalized. They, they were made deliberately de dependent. So they just hung around waiting for somebody to come and feed them. They didn't even know that the Allies were going to arrive. For all they knew, the Allies were months away. But yeah, they just stayed put and just stayed hungry. Uh, they didn't collaborate. They didn't try and feed themselves. They didn't organize themselves. They didn't try and do, they didn't even try and leave out of an open gate. And I think that's where we are now. This is the average liberal, I think, will do the same. <laughs> They will it's wait for the state to feed me. They'll, they'll sit at home, they'll complain, they'll tweet, saying, I'm hungry, you know, this, why isn't the state feeding us? And, and they, you know, there's no tradition where you say, like, screw the state. You want to be fed? <laughs> You've got to get off your ass. Sam and Bill not, <laughs> not making a comparison. But the fish? Yeah, they, mm. they escape from the cages sometimes. The seals damage the cages and they get out. They hang around there waiting to be fed. Yeah. The, the farmed fish? Farmed yeah. fish, yeah. What, they what, do. That, but this is this is what Frederick Douglass said. Is 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 I must do more on slavery because I, I've got a unique insight because my upbringing was in, in a bygone age. It was kind of like an amber. It was like you know, <laughs> uh, kind of frozen in time, my upbringing was and so so, but I got an insight into how plantations work and stuff, and it's not like people think. And I think I should communicate how how uh, a plantation works. Frederick Douglass said a lot of this, um, and I've seen this with my own eyes, is they weaponize food in in a plantation. The slaves' uh, food is a, is a weapon to hold a, a plantation together, and um, all the way down to uh, Frederick Douglass pointed out about. About, and I've saw, I saw this in South Africa. We used to do this. When I was a kid, we used to do this. Is, you, know, you, you know that a, a time of uh, Christmas is a time of rebellion because basically you're going to have a huge feast. You're basically the whole harvest of the year and everything is going to be turned into a big blowout feast in Christmas. And all the slaves, are, you can't like, you know, stick them in the cellar is while you revel up there, basically you, you won't make it through to Boxing Day because there'll be a revolution. So, we, so to keep them quiet, we did this in Africa, is you just give them lots of goodies. You just give them booze and get them tanked up on booze. And then Frederick Douglass said that he knew what they were doing, and so he refused alcohol. And so the, but he got he got uh, trouble not only from the foreman but from the other slaves because the other slaves said you're not yeah. grateful they here we, we we you know this is our one time to get booze and to get food and stuff and and you turn ah. it down you know you should be grateful that we got this opportunity and so his own fellow slaves uh you know but if if he had convinced them presumably to just boycott the, the alcohol boycott, yeah. and uh the the, then, then you know, the, the, the slave owners wouldn't have had a Christmas. They couldn't have afforded to let their guard down. <laughs> That's extremely interesting. That's extremely is, uh, interesting. Yeah. yeah, thanks for that. Because that, 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 that puts me... Because I, I get the same feeling when I, when I see people on their phones. They're, they're, they're in an institution and they're, they, they're um, you know, like the... What do you call it when you give a baby um, a dummy, you know, and you just... You know, they're, they're pacified. Yeah. It's, pacified. It's, it's digital pacification. That's that's we're under, under a monstrous digital pacification program, and it's it. I, I saw this develop in South Africa because the the uh, the Afrikaners they didn't you know the modern world was evil for them. They kind of you know fascists always have this kind of uh, close to the earth thing, very close to green uh, green thing which people don't often associate with them. But Hitler was a vegetarian. Yeah, Hitler, and he loved dogs, and he's very, it's all blut and soil, you know, blut and soil, mm -hmm. all that blut and soil, you know, it's basically, they just, it's virtually ritualized. So you can cut a finger, put German blood in the soil and grow Aryan children. It's virtually, you know, it's that romanticized. <laughs> and the, 
and so the the fascists love that idea of that close to the soil stuff and outdoors and climbing mountains and stuff like that. And so so uh, so the Afrikaners were were also like that. Modern tech frightened the bejesus out of them. So they kept television out of the country until 1975. So the first time <laughs> the first time I saw television was I was like nine years old in Bulawayo in Rhodesia. And it was the most fascinating thing known to man. The first time I got television in our home, I was 15. And it was because the apartheid government was terribly scared that they would lose control. They didn't know that it was the perfect tool for control. So when they eventually allowed it, then they gradually started to get the power of television. They gradually started to learn uh, after 1975 that you could control images you could control the people and then they started this program of digital pacification but i got to see how a government learns the tools of the trade uh, from the inside and to see how it all works how broadcasting uh, companies are controlled how how it all works and stuff and so mm -hmm. now they call you oh you're a conspiracy theorist because they don't understand how subtle these these uh, levers and strings are that the, the government uses, but um, you know it's 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 just a question of putting the right people that think the right way in the right positions. You don't have to be on the phone as Rupert Murdoch saying, you know, hey, I want the story to run. They don't have that kind of control. They just make sure that the guy that thinks like them is um, is somewhere in yeah. the hierarchy. Yeah, uh, on tele yes, on television and mobile, they're filling this this uh, this. This gap at the moment. It's extremely well. The, yeah. the wagons are well circled here at the moment. It's completely, they've complete control <clears throat> almost from the, the media. But, but so, can we start a campaign of uh, rebellion against digital pacification? Oh, that, that, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But uh, it seems like an enormous task. We're, we're surrounded with people who are who are completely digitalized. You know, we had we had a couple last summer visiting us, and one of them couldn't he couldn't even leave his phone when he was having dinner. You know, it's like the thing. Body. But, but yeah, okay, so so you know, because I I am a techie, and I've uh, you know basically I'm an anti-tech yeah. techie. We are not. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you, there, there's just there's just a whole field of techies to harvest if they can be turned around to think that tech is bad. And, and so, so the kind of thing that I dream of is it, there's a, a whole sliding scale of things that you can do. And, you know, I'm, I mean, it's a great way of breaking the ice and getting people involved in practice and revolutionary activity because you can start so small you can just get something like i mentioned before about that uh, tv be gone thing so so what i imagine yeah, is yeah. You, you can get um you a tiny bit of electronics about yay big that you could make at home or buy for five cents or your mate mm -hmm. or something and it would just be an ir um basically an LED, an infrared LED, and you could plug it in the same jack on your Android phone, and it would be just like the, you know, TV be gone. It basically just puts a, a makes, makes your phone into a remote, right? Into I, a weapon. <laughs> well, no, it's just into a, into a TV yeah, yeah, remote. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I mean, I, I would be surprised if such a thing doesn't exist already, where you can turn your phone into a remote. And I'm sure there's people doing that. I yeah, hope. you would think. And so, so here's the thing is you just get an app that, uh, you know, either you, you put in what the make of TV is or otherwise it just goes through the whole, the whole gamut. But you just go through the Philips IR codes and try and switch off TVs and, you know, reset them and stuff. And so you sit in a bar just basically, you know. In, in Wuhan. In Wuhan. <laughs> yeah. You basically do just just say so, but the thing is that it's it it would radicalize people qu quickly because if you think about it, if you were a kid doing this, you've got to be pretty subtle to do it because it's pretty soon everybody will know. Okay, let's imagine this is a campaign from XR. Yeah, and they soon realize it'll be in the papers if you're lucky uh, that like oh XR is bloody doing this 
anti-digital pacification campaign and then they, they, they're switching off TVs and bars. A, there'll be so many false positives when somebody gets their face beaten up because they, they think <laughs> that they did. <laughs> but other, but the, other thing is, the other thing is you, you're busy radicalizing somebody for doing something that's not even illegal. Uh, yeah. Because they have to sit at a bar, and the, well, you imagine the big game is on the TV, and they're sitting there, and you, you've got to be subtle, so you're already you're training them to be a, a James Bond. Uh, then, then, you know, they're switching off the TV as fast as anybody can come and switch it back on, and you basically try and get a factory reset on there, until eventually the whole bar is just about ready to tear somebody's head off, although they can't just tell who's doing this. I uh, love that's, this. That's, that's training. That's revolutionary training right there. I love this. I love mm -hmm. this. But, and, it, <laughs> and, and it's legal, but, but you go from there, when, once people get into that game and get an adrenaline rush of doing this kind of thing, is it, you can just expand it from there. You can do EMP devices that will take out people. So you just go into a bar with a backpack, um, flick a switch, and you might be able to get 10 you know, 10 meters around you, take out everybody's cell phone and walk out again. Uh, you know, you, you can do that all the way up until cars and really illegal stuff um, till you're eventually going after machinery and stuff. But, but my, my, my thing is, is clocks, go after clocks, the, the heart yes. of all the slave system. Yes. This, yes. Is, this is one thing which I've been yes. trying to tell people is uh, my understanding of slavery is, is people yes. don't understand what a, what a slave system worked on. A plantation, if you go to it, the, a plantation, if you go in the Cape to one of the wine farms, they were all slave uh, plantations. So you can see in the cellars where the slaves slept, you can go and lie on one of the, the beds, which are stone, and feel how, how ratchet, terrible it was to be a slave. All of them have one thing right in the middle, and it's a slave bell. And that slave bell kept the whole plantation running. And I know that because I went to a school which was basically a gulag. It was designed, it was on the English school system, it was designed for, you know, basically to turn out people for empire. And it had a slave bell like that. We had to ring it as, as basically first year as freshmen. Um, we had a week where we would have to be the bellboy. And you would get, I got cane six by the headmaster who was a, who was a, a springbok cricketer. Uh, and he really could wield a thing because I was like 10 minutes late. I got really engrossed in this biology class or something. And I was, <laughs> and then suddenly everybody is saying, Oh, look at the time, look at the time. And I was like, Oh shit. And I had to run to the bell. And then as I was there, this guy, you know, this, the, the guy, um, uh, Hal Doxon, his name was Anton Murray, and his, uh, he, he, you know, they had, the masters had capes, so we used to call him Batman, because he would have this huge flowing <laughs> cape behind him, and he comes swooping down to me, and he says, boy, why are you late with the bell, and I was like, I'm sorry, sir, I was distracted, and he said, like, he said, because of you, the entire school has to wait 10 minutes, boy, in my office, and he came me six, and and it was like, uh, and so, yeah. But but that bell was a slave bell, and it regulated yeah, yeah. everything we did. It kept that was the heart. If if you had one thing <coughs> that would destroy that entire school, take out the slave bell. And the same, it's same. It's just got more elaborate um, as as we go. <coughs> well, my coronavirus is playing up. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but it, it's, it's the same deal. It's got more and more elaborate, but, but the punch clock in the factory, um, the, in our computer, basically computers are just big clocks. They just have a clock in the middle. Same yes, with phones. Yes, yes. Uh, you just basically have to take out the clocks, take out the clocks. Uh, it, the whole system, this whole system of oppression, the whole thing about uh, digital pacification is based on a clock. It's, you, most of what they're doing in school is to train you to live off a clock. Uh, I know. Everything is done on the clock. If you, I know. People don't realize this. If you go and look at World War I, where they sent all these people over into the meat grinder, they did it by the clock. They did it by the clock. You can't, you can't tell people, 
hey, sometime in the afternoon, wait until the weather gets cool and then go over the top and get shot to bits. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so like, yeah, yeah. The way they did it was coordinating a time. So everybody knew that at 10 o'clock we go over the top. They knew it weeks ahead, months ahead. And it's important in the psychology of making you go over the top. Is, so how do you make Kronos time? eat the big stone? <laughs> What's that? How do you make Kronos eat the big stone? The big, the big stone is, you... <laughs> is, is make him choke, no. make him choke on his, that stone is making him choke on his own technology. Hmm. So basically the, uh, uh, so this, the stone was subterfuge, right? The, the stone, the stone is basically what Kronos is doing is substituting all the time. Our alien cortex is, is a substituting. And, mm -hmm. and so what it is, is to take the real thing and, and substitute a fake thing. So, uh, so to the, the lesson from the stone fed to Kronos is, is in, take for instance, somebody at work in a, in a workplace run by the yeah. clock, is, yeah. is to steal time back. Time is what, what Kronos is taking. So you, you give your employer shitty, shitty work product or as little as possible and you steal time to work against the corporation and the yeah. plantation. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's, it's to, so, okay, here's an example. Now that this is a great example for one thing that might be coming soon and that many white collar workers will be sent home to telecommute. Now, when you're mm -hmm. telecommuting, you should be using that time to shortchange your company, um, get steal back time, and use that time for subversive activities. That's that's what you should be using your time for. That's how you give uh, um, you give your employer a facsimile of yourself. Just give them a stone, mm -hmm. and that way mm -hmm. you can steal back some time, which then you must invest in in radical activity. And then a good thing is to make EMP devices and things which will you know really. Take the you know have, you, you, have you have, have you got one? <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the opportunities for these things on a on a boat are um, no. <laughs> are quite a, well, 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 you don't want to get your own boat, but um, there's so many batteries and electronics and electronics. cables and stuff that, yeah, are yeah. That, that are just lying around a boat yard. <laughs> it's just it's, it's of God, course it's of God's course. gift to that. Yeah. Now we're quite we're quite far away from cities here, very very far away to create um, personally mayhem in a in 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 a big con urban concentration. And even the west of Ireland, our biggest city is Galway, and it's how many people in Galway? Hundred thousand? Small, yeah. maybe. No, um, here's, here's here's what I'd recommend is is experiment with doing um, Chinese lanterns. Ah, the yeah, 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 with the tin foil. Yeah, do do a video <laughs> on how to make a lantern. And, yeah, and I've watched it, and yeah. I've actually kept it in my bookmarks. <laughs> <laughs> well, those uh, so the yeah ba basically so so let me let me yeah, do radical. Okay, cool. let me do radical Sunday here. Okay, let's let me show you. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay. You get, can you see that? Yeah. So you get you get a number of these sponges, right? Right. Um, you cut them up and stack them together with with glue, a kind of a glue that will burn like the schnutz, right? Yeah. <laughs> Epoxy, right? Yeah. Epoxy glue. Yeah. Um, then you get a hoop, either bamboo or cardboard, make, make a big hoop. You get four lines and put them across here. Okay, that makes a, the hoop is bottom of a skirt. Um, you can make it out of bin liners, one of those thin bin liners. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, the very thin plastic. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's all, white um, things, yeah. Like that. And then, um, yeah, you just put uh, rubbing alcohol and uh, burn it, and it, it's it's great fun. It's not even illegal, actually. It's uh, it's in um, a number of state states are making it illegal. They will make it illegal shortly, especially if you want to 
not in this video. <laughs> but the uh, that if you just get a little, so basically it's a way of getting window up the chafe. They they call it window in the World War Two when they invented it. They didn't want to use window very much in World War Two because Britain relied so much on on radar. Yes, it was their big advantage. And so if they started using window, they realized the Luftwaffe would start using it and radar would be useless. So, so they held back, although they understood the principle. Um, that the thing is, you just get a, a bit of tinfoil that's half the wavelength that you're trying to get. And the wavelength is like uh, microwave is 2.45 gigahertz. It's 14.25 mm -hmm. centimeters. But uh, mm -hmm. most radar is somewhere in the range of um, about 10 centimeters. Um, and so you, you get a five centimeter strip. Um, so and it, completely yeah, completely basically completely. give a big return. So you just put, you know, loads of strips <coughs> all on the outside of that. And um, then for, for as long as it stays in the air, it gives a radar return. And they, they, I don't think they're very good at telling how high that would be. So, you know, wow. there are a lot of places up when you can let those off. And, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. They were used here on the, with the British Navy, the, the salmon boats that left Donegal and you know, northwest of Ireland. Because they'd be followed at night when they'd been on the, with a disputed zone between, between Scotland and Northern Ireland. Yeah. So they they'd let off heli helium balloons with the tin foil. Oh and yeah, helium's expensive as all hell though. It was, but the salmon were too. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you're talking about ten grand a throw for a for a helium balloon. No, but those are the small, you know, the kids' balloons. Yeah. Oh, those kind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's all you need. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, just just as long as you don't do a Roger Hallam and stick around to f f face the heat, <laughs> that's dumb. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, you know this, you know this book. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Um, I don't exactly. It's a bit a outdated. It's, it's I, very outdated. Yeah, there's there's a there's a dreadful movie um, about it, and oh. yeah, it, it was based, it's a uh, anti a, a state propaganda movie really, and it's about it's called the Anarchist Cookbook, and what it, it was, it was basically the message at the end of the book is like, uh, don't be an anarchist, it's a waste of time, be a constructive member of society, it has a bigger payback. That was the message of the movie. <laughs> Okay, so that's that's a good idea. This uh, this uh, window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, just a, a helium balloon is 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 good enough too. If basically if people in in XR did that, um, there's so many people in XR that you could, you know, you could keep aviation on I the ground know. forever. <laughs> do, do you get any do you get any feedback from active members of XR who start to think? along the lines of a more active action like what you were suggesting yes because, yes but yeah. you see they i don't engage with them because they it's uh, too a lot of them are state actors so it's too difficult to sort out the state actors but the the point is mm -hmm. that you don't need state actors you have to encourage people to go out and do it on their own what what people don't realize is the, the chances of the state getting you, if you go and do one of these actions on your own, the chances of the states um, getting you are absolutely yeah. negligible. It's when you mm -hmm. have other people involved, that's, yeah. that's when, yeah. when it all comes up. But I, how much time have you got left? Um, you mean time? <laughs> <laughs> time. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, we're okay, but it's you because I've got, I see it's 20 past four here. You started the call at three o'clock. So that's one hour, oh. 20 minutes nearly. Oh, okay. Well, well, no, I just wanted to tell you this, this story then, and then which is on this, this topic. So um, if you've got time to hear it, it basically yeah. was, is diving. So uh, if you've ever done scuba diving, have you ever done scuba, yeah. any scuba diving? Yeah. Have you, have you done the paddy course? 
Yeah. yeah, so so what I did the paddy course in California and one of the big things about the paddy course you'll know is about buddy diving and they drill into you that you must have a buddy, you must have a buddy and stuff. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a little bit skeptical on this because yeah. every time I've gone into trouble diving, it's been because of my buddy. <laughs> and I thought like, after a while I got, got to thinking, you know, I'd rather be right next to, I'd rather have a great white shark that was hungry <laughs> as hell as a buddy diving buddy than the average diver <laughs> because they just damn lethal. And, and so I started to really wonder about this buddy system. The thing that eventually brought it to, to the hilt was this, have you ever done shared breathing? Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, you. yeah. Well, so, so, so just to tell people that see this, that don't know what shared breathing is, is they teach you that say, if, if one person gets in trouble with their regulator or something is that you, you know, if your buddy gets into trouble, then you share a regulator. And I've never, especially the quickest way to die is to share a regular. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think they teach it anymore because basically it's, it's a way to kill people. Oh my God. But basically, if you ever tried, have you ever tried to do buddy breathing? You have, I yeah. I, I would show it, that I you get into a situation where it always happened like this: is that, is you know the one person gets a little bit behind in their breath, <laughs> <laughs> so they, they hang on to the regulator a little bit, and then they, and then and then they, the they pass it over a little bit. By the time you get it, you you're a little bit behind, and, <laughs> and, they're a little behind, and it gets worse and worse. It's kind of like a tragedy of the commons, you know. <laughs> It's the, it's the best illustration of the tragedy of the commons that you can possibly get. <laughs> and, and so basically I came to the conclusion, I said, look, if you at depth and you run out of air, you, you're in deep, deep shit if you're relying on your body. It's a great way to kill two people instead of one. And so I started saying this, to the, I started saying this heresy to the diving instructors. And they, they went, it was like a, it was a religious reaction. On them. Yeah. So, and so, so uh, because this was the key tenant of this the thing, and I started to talk to other people, and I thought this, you know, I've always been anti-religious, and as soon as I, I saw this was a religion, then I started to, you know, think heresy, and so I started to find out that there was a big underground of heretics that said, no, the buddy diving system is lethal. It's okay. like, just let me switch to the lights on. So, so, um, so, so yeah, so the, the, oh, now we can see you. <laughs> ah, yeah, so, so yeah, so they had this, uh, the system was, was absolutely lethal. And after that, I realized, I started to find out that there was a community of guys who would dive solo in California. And it was all underground thing and greatly frowned upon and, and stuff. And I started diving solo. Then I suddenly sound it was much, much safer. Uh, one of the things that I found was, was you, without realizing it, you get complacent. Having, having a buddy that you, yeah. you know, every bit of safety equipment. I, even on a boat, I'm very nervous about safety equipment because it makes people complacent. The more safety equipment you have, the more complacent people get. If you say like, the ideal thing is to have safety equipment and nobody knows about it. <laughs> so you say, no safety <laughs> equipment on this boat, then everybody's hyper cautious. And then, mm. but so, uh, so that's what I found is that you, my diving was instantly safer when I did it alone. And my mm. diving buddy was a pony bottle. I just had a little pony bottle and then that's, but all the times I've run out of air, got into trouble and stuff, it's all been with other with people me. and because of other people. Yeah. And, it, and so it suddenly got a hundred times safer diving solo. And that I started to, yeah. there's, there's a human compulsion to want solidarity and, and stuff like that. But, but from that diving experience, I realized that the, a lone wolf, uh, uh, if you don't tell anybody what you're doing, you can do almost anything. And the chances, you know, the chances of, if you look in history of, of um, you know, all these kind of murderers like Crippen and the Jack the Ripper and stuff, 
they can't catch him because they go, the guys are operating alone. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's absolutely impossible for the state to catch you. They basically have to catch you red-handed and it's so easy to, you know, so it's a bit more difficult with the surveillance state, but the liability is other people. And what our psychology tells us is there's safety in numbers, you know, stick with it. And the XR itself is momentum building. Yeah. So, yeah. so the, sa- the thing is that, you know, you, you, you have to act absolutely alone. Absolutely. It's, it's basically just like in 1984, you know, it's like I sold you and you sold me. You know, that was, that's the Chestnut Tree Cafe. You know? was, I, I completely agree with you. I completely yeah. agree with you. But if, if there are people that understand that and, uh, you know, um, get, get a thrill out of being alone, there's a certain thrill. I, I found also with diving that there was a real thrill to, to diving solo. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you, you were free. You were really free. You could do much more, go much further, um, be safer. Uh, I just, it, it was much more dramatic it was much more daring it was much more of a thrill um Mm -hmm. and so i could see from from that that taught me that you can become you know you can get kind of addicted to to operating as a lone wolf and so i think that's what you know basically we should be doing things videos like this to tell people so you have a network and discussion and groups about it but when you do actual activities, when you do an action, absolutely on your own, not a breath. No, a even, breath your, even your You're spouse breathing. could never tell you you're acting as an underground operative. And if you do that, oh, there's so much uh, you could actually do. But you've widened the scope so much. You just suddenly got all the possibilities. You don't have the weight of organized groups. You don't have the, 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 yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Well, well, here's another thing from, from, from software. So what I realized I had another epiphany of this in software is, um, again, you have this team dynamic where there's, you know, oh, it's all about team and stuff. And I I started to realize, and I started reading up on this and saying that it, the overhead of a team is extraordinary. There's this thing called Nyquist theory, that if you keep on adding nodes to a network, uh, it, it goes up by the n squared, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. So, so basically, if you think about, you know, if you have two people, they have one communication path between them. If you have three people, now, now you have uh, three communication paths. Mm-hmm. Right? Four... They basically go up for four, five, six, six, right? And it keeps it goes up exponentially the number of communication paths as you add people. So there ways there ways round it, like you have a hierarchy and you have one guy that tells other guys what to do and stuff. But ultimately, what I discovered is in computer programming teams, and this is backed up by a lot of research that they spend seventy five percent of the time just coordinating. Oh, yeah. So what I found was if you, since the average team, they say should be no bigger than a pizza box because, you know, they say basically you, you have a one pizza team basically or because they pacify, they pacify the programmers by giving them pizzas, but it's kind of condescending thing, but mm. you know, the, the slaves, the digital slaves, they give them a pizza. It's just Silicon yeah. Valley shit. Yeah. It's, it's a, so, so, and then the, 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 they go, ooh, pizza, oh, food. Again, food is slavery. You see it in an office in America. And then, so they call one pizza teams because that's how many people, you know, you can have a pizza at lunch, so you can buy, buy a pizza for the team. And so, so I started figuring, well, if that's what they think is the optimum. If you look at what one person can do on their own, you can actually do the work of a pizza team because you eliminate all the coordination. And so I suddenly, once I realized that, you found that basically me as a one person team, I could do the work at 10, a team of 10 on my own. And when I had a software company, I did that. I made people work on their own as a team. And, you know, you could, instead of putting 10 people together to work on one project, 
you get far more, you get about 100 times the production if you get, you know, 10 people to work on their own project. Or, That's or very interesting. Thank you for that. That's really interesting. Yeah. So, so that that's so. If you think of all the time and effort and money that goes into coordinating yeah. actions, like, oh, I like something, and just imagine the carbon footprint of what what XR is doing. And, but I, yeah, I think I mentioned to you, Martin. Remember, in June last year, we went to a meeting that was more or less coordinated by this adaptation, but it was a lot of members of XR, and and it, the meeting went on and on, rambling because they were into that sort of coordinating thing and I was really like what the hell are we doing here but you know there was everything was instead of going straight to, to, to the point that we needed to you know things we needed to share and stuff it was uh, little stickers put on walls and now you have to talk and now we have to coordinate with this group at that table and this table now is rain is brainstorming about this issue and then you have to stand up and share it with everyone and I thought do you remember that was just yeah. It's the most unproductive way of getting a, a, a group up to do some things that I never ever experienced, you know, and I think oh. they're doing that in every cell of their movement. Oh yeah, man, then that's before you get like the 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 five percent that deliberately obstructive and undermine the whole thing with all their special needs and pretty soon, you know, the, the group serving the one percent of idiots on the side, you know. And the empathy circle. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, if, if you're operating on your own, you don't need empathy circles. No. <laughs> Think of all the time saving. But because all this you know, right. about nothing, all this storm in a teacup just to get something done. Uh, you know. say you just just say operate alone, just just do it alone, and then so then you you have so the way I see it is you have a loose affiliate affiliation. It's almost like a club or a secret society. Where people, you know, you, the most people know about you is you, you are a Scarlet Pimpernel on, in the quiet. And that's yeah. all they need to know. You, you yeah. absolutely do not say what you do. Um, and, you, and you get into a game where you, you make, uh, make sure that people can't guess, can't, can't tie you up to things. But this, I, having, I've, I've been through, the legal system not for activism and stuff for commercial law and for business and uh, so i've got a quite a good grounding in the law and commercial law um the hard way <laughs> basically on the, the stand usually do when you're in contact with the law <laughs> yeah no but but basically for a civil law because that's what business is in america it's just rich people trying to strong arm little guys like me and so, you know, I got an education in the law. What I realized in, in the thing is that if you're operating alone and in, in America, you can take the fifth. Um, there's, abs there's no court in the land that can convict you. There's, there, there, because, because there's, you know, everything's corrupt. All the forensics is corrupt. The police are corrupt. The whole system is corrupt. So if you don't have anybody... The whole system in America, the legal system, the criminal criminal law, re relies on turncoats and and plea bargains. So if you don't plea bargain, you take the fifth, and you have no accomplices. There's there's very little they can do. If you look at people like Ted Kaczynski and that, they were shopped by by he was shot by his brother if he if he didn't have a brother that recognized his writing, he would still be out in this log cabin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Making EMPs, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, he should have done EMPs. He was he was really stupid because it was early enough. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. If Ted, you see, I, I get the impression that that Ted Kaczynski thought that he had to uh, make bombs because you know that's the only way he could be heard and taken seriously. Mm. I think I get the impression from reading the stuff that that's. that's I think so cool. too. I think yeah. that's that's the reason why he did that. Yeah. But but I question that. I think that if he had have done a non-violent campaign or non-lethal campaign, uh, he might have actually been more of a rock star. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. But that was a. Yeah, I want my voice to be heard. Me, Ted. I think in that because. 
Yeah, he would. He would. He didn't want to be anonymous, really, did he? That's the problem. That's what all these guys are really doing it from a point of ego. And there's yeah. a little part of them that you know, basically, they want to be want to be like caught gun. and be famous. It's part of. It's mm -hmm. kind of a messiah syndrome, right? Yeah. He even left his trademark. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. True. If 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 that's what you want to do, if you want to sell out for <laughs> being in a cage for the rest of your life, go for it. But I think to me, it's pretty darn stupid. I think you should be. Uh, and and one of his plea was that his manifesto would be published in the New York Times. I think or one of those American papers. That was one of his. One of his. Um, um, that's how he's yeah, yeah. his, his brother recognized the writing. Yeah. 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 Recognized the time. I mean, why would you like to be published in such a, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. an ego yeah. thing. It's, it's basically, this is, yeah, that's the important thing about motivation for a lone wolf campaign is, is that it's not about ego. It's not about a result. We're not, we're, you're not trying to get, change the world. It's just about what you do as a human being. It's about humanity and about uh, how, how, what pose you strike in this situation that we're in. You do it out of love for humanity. Yeah, but not out of love for yourself, not or, for yourself. Or, no. or, or, or love yeah. for a new system or love for yeah. an ideology. No. You, you, no. you just say, look, my fellow human beings are caged chimps. I'm just mm -hmm. opening the door for them. That's all I'm doing. I, there are no manifesto, no manifestos. They're like no demands. There's nothing, no success criteria. The success criteria is built into it by what you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. Mm -hmm. well, maybe we should end on that note. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. The love of humanity. Okay. So um, thank you very much keep the keep the videos coming i was uh, I, I treated myself to listening to the three darwin one the other evening which is really good completely different line but that was really good <laughs> and vicky <and Dickie> dawkins <laughs> hey um what, one of the things that i really want to do with with you guys is um is to revive those memories of old forgotten heroes and just show what's uh expert yeah oh yeah should we for next time do you want to name yeah. one and we just 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 if, if you tell me in advance then then we'll, we'll um i can research it and stuff so that i i know what you're talking about and then absolutely maybe, maybe yeah. You, yeah. you guys maybe martin if you take the lead and just just tell people Sing the praises of somebody from yesteryear and mm. just bring them into the present. We need the ghosts of the past, revive the, the bones of the ancestors. It was always traditional at these times of crisis to revive the spirit of the ancestors. And yes. we need to do it. Yeah. 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 She wasn't available. She was, no, she was really. <laughs> talking about famous or unknown would be good. Yeah, yeah, unknown um, on some heroes of the of, the, of the rebellion anyway. here. Um, I that can't think of anything just off my head there, but definitely you you will probably mm -hmm. yeah. And we'll talk about that other interview with Mark. And if you, the problem is that you have to write to him. Yeah, but uh, and uh, I and then if, if you need to give a post address for reply, if you're up for so a I, I can, trip, I'd love to do it. So can can you get cell phone coverage over there? Yes, there's there's three G where he is, so oh, I could yeah. I could take my cell phone and you could do it on a on a Zoom with him on the cell phone, or I could take my laptop and you could go somewhere else. I'm sure he has a friend around who would probably oblige him with Wi-Fi if he needed to. But that depends if he if he's around if he wants to talk to you and all that. So I, I just don't yeah. know how he yeah. has your way. If you think about it, I, I'm going to write to him in the next few days because I want to ask him something about gardening. Um, and uh, but I can I can liaise in any way you think. I leave you I leave the logistics into your hands. I would love it if you would. In terms it. of anti tech and not an anti tech in a good way, he's a guy. 
he's a guy who thought a lot and spent a lot of time on his own and he's uh, he's wonderful to talk to he's yeah, really yeah I've, I've i've seen some of the videos and i haven't yeah. read so this is mark boyle by the way and it's um yeah, uh, it, it, he is uh i think the best thing he's known for is um drinking molotov cocktails with gandhi yeah and the moneyless man that gave him a lot of fame um in 2007 2008 he did it in 2008 so uh, 2009 yeah so it was quite yeah it was great coverage on the on the media about that well tell them tell them how we're getting on with corona he he, <laughs> he probably hasn't heard yet <laughs> <laughs> he's probably thinking of his garden and going to chop wood and catch a few pike in the lake and, oh how's it going yeah. in civilization well, yeah. you should mention that. <laughs> <laughs> All I have to say is, they'll be coming as many as the stars as come across the so Mark, you better get ready for a bit of an influx. Like <laughs> people, are, people are coming. Well, he has a hostel. He has a hostel there on the ground. You can <laughs> yeah, <laughs> visitors, visitors are coming. <laughs> Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, well, well, oh, cool. Let's let's uh let's do that then. Let's uh, Okay. Yeah. And thanks for the thanks for the laugh. Thanks for everything. And take care. You too. You too. <laughs> I, I, okay, we'll meet up on uh on Reddit again. <laughs> we will. We will. Definitely. Well, thanks guys. Take care. Ed. Thank you. Thank best. you Thank very you. much. You. Bye. Bye.